All right, so here we are into chapter five now, chemical accounting. Uh, so as you'll see, we have to make sure that we obey the law of conservation of mass uh, and that uh, from the uh, reactant side to the product side of chemical reaction, we have all the same number and types of atoms uh, just simply rearranged into new and different compounds. Okay, now looking at uh, some of our learning objectives for this chapter, we will identify balanced and unbalanced chemical equations, and those that are unbalanced, we will balance the equations by inspection, looking at what's on the reactant and product sides. We'll also determine volumes of gases that react using a balanced equation for a reaction. We'll see there's a special way that we can look at gas volumes uh, without necessarily having to look at masses or moles directly. We'll calculate the formula mass, the molecular mass, or the molar mass of a substance, and we'll use Avogadro's number to determine the number of particles of different types in the mass of a substance. We'll also be able to convert from mass to moles and from moles back to mass of a substance. Uh, we'll calculate the mass or the number of moles of a reactant or product from the mass or number of moles of another reactant or product. So uh, we'll be able to look at uh, the relative ratios in a chemical reaction. And then we'll be able to calculate the concentration, so molarity, percent by volume, or percent by mass, of a solute in a solution. This could either be a liquid uh, phase solution like we're used to, or a gaseous solution, uh, or even a solid solution depending on the application. Finally, we'll be able to calculate the amount of solute or solution given the concentration and the other amount, uh, and we'll explain how the concept of atom economy can be applied to pollution prevention and environmental protection uh, in our green chemistry segment. And then lastly, we'll calculate the atom economy for chemical reactions. So one of the hallmarks of students who've taken college level chemistry is that the, they are able to read chemical equations. Chemical equations are really just chemical sentences uh, and they communicate uh, chemical change using symbols and formulas to represent the elements and compounds involved in a chemical reaction. So uh, this stuff that may have uh, looked a bit uh, off-putting and difficult to understand after just a little bit of practice, you'll be able to read from left to right our chemical sentences just like you've been able to read sentences in English for some time. Okay, so again, we uh, typically will read from left to right, just like uh, in English. So we'll have our reactants on the left-hand side, and those reactants are the species that are present before the reaction takes place. There are starting materials. And then we'll have uh, an arrow in between that uh, means uh, yields or reacts to form or produce, whatever the case may be, something to that effect. And then on the right-hand side after the arrow, we'll have the products, and those are the species that are formed during the reaction and therefore or present after reaction. In order for a chemical equation to be complete and correct, we'll also indicate the phase of each reactant and product. Uh, and so the phase or state of uh, matter for that species is indicated with uh, an abbreviate, uh, uh, open parenthesis and then a letter and then a closed parenthesis. And the letters that we'll see in our course will be S for solid, L for liquid, G for gas, or AQ, meaning that substance is dissolved in aqueous solution. So for sodium chloride, for instance, that's a solid at room temperature and pressure, uh, but uh, we may be using it already dissolved in water, so we would indicate that as uh, parenthesis AQ, uh, and parenthesis, rather than uh, parenthesis S, and parenthesis. So it's important to know whether you're dealing with the solid sodium chloride table salt crystals, or whether that sodium chloride has been dissolved in solution. And in our course, we'll only look at aqueous solution for these substances. So in addition to the chemical symbols and the uh, physical phase or state of the reactants and products, uh, we're also likely to see coefficients. These are numbers in front of the chemical uh, formula and uh, they are used to balance a chemical equation. So we don't change subscripts. Uh, let's say we have uh, H2O and we need to have a total of four atoms of hydrogen and two atoms of oxygen on the left hand side. We wouldn't say suddenly H4O2, that's incorrect, that changes the substance. So instead we'd put a coefficient of two uh, out in front. So as we see at the uh, very bottom case there, 
uh, where they have two H2O uh, product molecules for that correctly balanced reaction. Okay, so we're always careful to, once we have the correct uh, formula for uh, the pure substance that's reacting or pr being produced, we don't change the subscripts, we only will add coefficients. Just like with the subscripts, we don't say H2O1, we never show the 1, it's implied. That's the same rule for coefficients. We would never show a coefficient of 1. So if we look at the bottom for that correctly balanced equation, 2H2 plus O2 yields or reacts to produce 2H2O. Notice there's no coefficient of 1 shown in front of the O2. It's understood to be present and therefore it does not need to be shown. Any other coefficient would need to be shown explicitly and there's why we see those 2's in front of the H2 on the left and the H2O on the right. Alright, as I already mentioned, we get a special relationship when we're combining volumes. Uh, so for uh, volumes of gases uh, that are being combined at the same temperature and pressure, the volumes of the gaseous reactants and products are all in small whole number ratios. So we see here uh, three volumes of hydrogen gas plus one volume of nitrogen gas react to form two volumes of ammonia gas. So we would still get the same sort of relationship where we have three H2 plus one N2 yields two H, uh, NH3s, uh, but in addition to talking about moles, uh, we could talk about volumes for gases. The reason that relationship works is due to Avogadro's hypothesis, which states that when measured at the same temperature and pressure, volumes of all gases will contain the same number of molecules. So therefore, if we uh, wrote the chemical equation, three moles of H2 gas plus one mole of N2 gas yields two moles of NH3 gas, then we'd also be correct to say that the three volumes plus the one volume yield the two volumes uh, because the uh, number of particles contained within each volume of the gas is the same, so they'll react in those same ratios. Notice that it still takes three volumes of hydrogen to react with each volume of nitrogen, so we do have to be concerned with that mole ratio, but in the case of gases, we can talk about volumes in addition to talking about moles or mass of reactants and products. So we've been dealing with Avogadro's number already in the course, but let's just take a step back and define it. So it's defined as the number of atoms in a 12 gram sample of carbon 12. Uh, that particular stable isotope of carbon has been used to define the mole. And uh, therefore that number is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, at least to two decimal places. We could go on and on and on, uh, but this is the way we'll tend to use it in our course. And there we see a nice uh, stamp of our good friend Amadeo Avogadro, who worked a lot with gases, hence the Avogadro's hypothesis in the previous slide, uh, and was able to use those gas relationships to uh, proposed the number. He didn't actually solve it. It was solved after his death, but in his honor, uh, we call it Avogadro's number because of the important work he did to discover it. And for the mole, uh, again, which we abbreviate as MOL, save all that time by not writing that final E, uh, it's defined as the amount of a substance that contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles. So depending on the substance, if we think about elements, uh, if we had a mole of sodium atoms, that would mean we'd have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles of sodium, uh, and therefore, uh, be based on the periodic table, we'd have a mass of 22.99 grams of sodium. So we can relate mass, mole, and number of atoms in the case of an element by this relationship. Likewise, if we think about lead, uh, lead is a much heavier element, so therefore each atom of lead is going to weigh more. And if we had that same number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of lead, we would have a mass of 207.2 grams. Again, from the periodic table, a uh, much larger value than the 22.99 grams for a mole of sodium atoms, but it makes sense since the lead atoms themselves are uh, much heavier and we have the same number of them. It's like having, um, you know, a dozen bowling balls versus a dozen golf balls. Obviously, we have 12 of each, but the golf balls have a much smaller mass. The bowling balls a much larger mass. Just to give us some perspective on the magnitude of a mole, uh, if we had a mole of baseballs, uh, that's something that we can think of at the macro scale, right? Uh, to have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd baseballs would be roughly the volume and mass of the Earth. 
So that's an incredible uh, number. It's a very, very large number, uh, and it only works because atoms are so small that to have a lot of them doesn't take up the entire volume or mass of the Earth. If we think about uh, something like drops of water, now much, much smaller than a baseball, but still, if we had that many drops of water, uh, then we'd have roughly the mass of the oceans on the Earth. So this is an incredible number, and that's why, as chemists, we need to be able to think of very large numbers of very small things like atoms. So uh, if we can get our heads wrapped around that idea of the mole, uh, then we can also think about formula mass. So a formula mass would be the average mass of a formula unit relative to that of a carbon-12 atom. So uh, the examples we've talked about so far involve uh, elements, atoms of elements. But if we had a formula unit, say sodium chloride, now we'd have to consider the mass contributed by the sodium ions and the chloride ions in that substance to get the overall formula mass. And the way we do that is to uh, add, to sum the atomic masses for all the atoms in the formula. Again, those are ions, sodium and uh, chloride, but uh, we essentially say the electron's massless, so we don't consider the mass of ions any different than the mass of the atoms. So if it's a molecule, uh, something like uh, methane, CH4, uh, two nonmetals combined, then we would use the term molecular mass. If it's a salt, a metal and a nonmetal like sodium chloride, then formula mass is the better uh, case because it's not truly a molecule and we wouldn't want to use the term molecular mass. Here we see a picture that has moles of a variety of substances. So uh, helium being a gas, uh, the mole of helium looks much larger because it's a gas. Uh, but just recall, gases are very, very far apart. So that's why it takes up so much volume at room temperature and pressure. Uh, it's essentially the smallest of all those samples in terms of the mass involved. That's about 4 grams of helium for that mole of helium. Uh, compare that with the copper, the carbon, the salt, and the sugar. Uh, the the co copper and carbon are elements, um, and carbon being a fairly low-density element looks like there's a lot of it for that 12 grams of carbon compared with that 63.55 grams of copper that uh, looks like less than the carbon, but that has to do with density. The copper is more tightly packed. Uh, and then finally, the salt and the sugar are compounds. Salt, we would have a formula unit of uh, sodium chloride being NaCl uh, and an overall formula mass, uh, therefore, of something like 58.55 grams for that mole of salt. Sugar uh, being uh, a molecular substance, right, C12, H22O11, uh, would have uh, a mass of around 360 grams for that mole of sugar, and we could call that a molecular mass because we have molecules in the case of sugar as opposed to a formula mass uh, because of salt being made up of ionic substances, sodium ions and chloride ions. Okay, so back to our mole concept. So we've talked about the mole as being 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles of a sample or being the uh, mass from the periodic table for an element or uh, the uh, mass from the formula for an ionic or molecular uh, in, uh, organic compound. Uh, there's another way to think about the mole and it's in terms of gases. So the molar volume of a gas uh, would be uh, again an ideal gas. So real gases behave a little differently but pretty much obey this rule that one mole of uh, a gas occupies a volume of 22.4 liters at standard temperature and pressure. So standard temperature and pressure uh, also known as STP is defined as one atmosphere of pressure and a temperature of zero degrees Celsius or uh, since we prefer Kelvin 273.15 Kelvin. So uh, notice it's not room temperature it's uh, temperature at which uh, ice melts or water freezes however you want to consider that process but uh, that's important for gases because it's easier to get a, a standard temperature of zero Celsius uh, across the world if we just use a, an ice water mixture and that's how the early gas work was done so that's why this uh, standard temperature for gas laws is uh, zero degrees Celsius or 273 Kelvin.
Here's a nice word for you that Microsoft Office doesn't know, stoichiometry. Stoichiometry uh, comes from the Greek stoichios, meaning an amount, uh, and it involves the quantitative relationship, the how much uh, relationship between uh, reactants and products in a balanced chemical uh, equation. So uh, this is where it's important to understand that uh, in chemistry, one plus one doesn't always equal two. Uh, and we've had numerous examples of this, things like a one mole of H2 gas plus uh, one half mole of O2 gas yields one mole of H2O. We don't normally have those half coefficients though, so it would be much more likely to see two moles of H2 gas plus one mole of O2 gas yields two moles of H2O liquid or gas depending on the temperature for that water. So the coefficients of a balanced chemical equation represent moles. If we were thinking about single molecules that it works as well but again to be on a practical scale we're typically dealing with a mole of the substance or if the coefficient is seven then that would be seven moles of that substance for instance just to have something at a workable scale. Uh, so we see here that uh, equation that I had just mentioned two moles of hydrogen plus uh, one mole of oxygen yields two moles of water uh, and so uh, again for a complete and correct uh, equation we should have the phases indicated hydrogen and oxygen that would usually be gases and then the water uh, could either be produced as a liquid or uh, as a gas at elevated temperature but uh, again uh, notice that for every two moles of hydrogen gas that react we get two moles of water so it's a one to one uh, ratio for every one mole of oxygen we get two moles of water so it's a one to two ratio uh, so on and so forth so the general steps involved in uh, doing one of these stoichiometric calculations first you have to make sure that you're dealing with a balanced chemical equation so if, if I give you the uh, chemical names you would write the chemical formulas and then uh, balance each species in the reaction to make sure that you're starting with a complete and correct balanced chemical equation. Next you would find the molar masses of the substances by looking at the periodic table uh, depending on if they're elements you could use the masses directly uh, from the table uh, but even some of the elements occur as molecules things like uh, oxygen as we saw it's O2 and hydrogen is H2 so you wouldn't be able to say that O2 has a molar mass of 16 from the table uh, it would indeed be 32.00 for O2 because there's two atoms of oxygen in every oxygen molecule so a mole of oxygen molecules would have twice the mass of a single oxygen atom in a mole basis. Finally we'd use coefficients from the balanced equation to convert moles of one substance into moles of another so we could look at uh, in a case where we have multiple reactants or multiple products we could be looking in terms of a reactant how much product would we get or uh, even within reactant side or product side what's the desired ratio. Finally the molar mass could be used to convert moles of the desired substance back to grams so this is a very typical uh, layout. We give you something where you start in grams, you convert to moles of that substance, you use the stoichiometry, the coefficients of the balanced chemical equation to relate uh, moles of one substance to moles of another in the balanced chemical equation, and then finally convert it back to mass. Uh, so sometimes uh, I'm nice and we just ask questions that go from moles of A to moles of B, but very frequently you'll see mass of A to moles of A to ma moles of B to mass of B. That's our standard steps. So taking a step back to that idea of those basic steps for uh, using these stoichiometric uh, values as conversion factors, here's a graphic that shows that. Uh, as I mentioned, a very typical scheme is that you start with mass of some substance, A we'll call it. Uh, it could be a reactant or it could be a product. Uh, and we know it's mass in grams. Uh, we can use the molar mass of A to go from grams of A to moles of A. Once we know the amount of A in moles from the balanced chemical uh, reaction, we can use coefficients to determine how A relates to any other species. Uh, it could be another reactant, it could be a product. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter because once we have those coefficients in the balanced chemical equation, we can relate A to anything else. So in this case, we'll say it, we relate it to amount of B in moles. Uh, and then finally, we would do the molar mass of B to go from moles back to grams. So we start in mass and grams, we end in mass and grams, but in between it's necessary that we uh, go into the mole so that we can make meaningful relationships. Mass relationships are not predictable in chemistry, but mole relationships are.
Okay, so another way that we can commonly think of uh, chemical reactions involves uh, solutions. So uh, solutions would uh, be a convenient way to get things that would be solids uh, as uh, pure substances. So sodium chloride, for instance, it's not very reactive as a solid, a lot of energy to overcome to get it to react. But if we dissolve it in water, uh, for instance, uh, an excellent solvent for most substances, we can get much uh, more uh, likelihood of reaction. So solutions are very common in chemistry and it's important that we understand solution concentration. That would be the amount of solute in a given amount of solvent. So the higher the number, the more of the dissolved species in that solvent. We use terms like dilute and concentrated. Again, these don't really mean a whole lot. Uh, it means that the dilute solution would have relatively small amounts of solute in the given amount of solvent, whereas a concentrated solution would have large amounts. Uh, but uh, again, we would prefer to be able to say that we have a one molar solution versus a 10 molar solution, for instance. That means a lot more than dilute or concentrated. Sometimes we use concentrated when we're talking about the most solute that we can get into a solvent. We'll call that a concentrated uh, solution. So something like concentrated hydrochloric acid would be around 12.1 moles of hydro uh, hydrogen chloride dissolved per liter of water. But again, these dilute and concentrated are relative terms. It's much better to have the exact concentration. And here's our equation to find the concentration. The most common way that we deal in concentration as chemists is using molarity. And molarity, which is abbreviated uh, as a capital M, is defined as moles of solute per liter of solution. So here's another time that mole concept creeps in. Uh, and again, because we're using the metric system in science, liters as opposed to volumes like gallons that might be common in everyday uh, American settings. So to find the molarity of a solution, you would have to know how many moles of solute, and you could get that from grams, obviously, using the molar mass, uh, and uh, you'd also need to know the volume of the solution. So as long as you have two of these three, or a way to get two of the three, uh, you can solve for the unknown. So you could be given the molarity of the solution and the volume, for instance, and you'd be able to find the number of moles. So it's a very powerful relationship, and it can be used in, in many ways. Uh, once you know two of the three, or, or as I said, if you're given a gram value for uh, the solute, well, then you can convert that into moles. So a, a powerful equation, and we'll get some practice with it uh, on uh, our uh, homework side. There are other uh, concentration expressions, of course. Uh, so here we see percent concentration. Uh, and this, uh, in particular, is a percent by volume. So the volume of solute divided by the volume of the solution times 100%. This would be useful for something like the uh, concentration of uh, ethanol, alcohol, in an alcoholic beverage, uh, something that you probably know as proof. Right, so uh, if it's 100 proof, that would mean it's 50% by volume of the ethanol compared to the total volume of the solution, which is usually just ethanol and water. So anytime you see a volume percent, it's just the volume of the solute divided by the volume of the solution times 100%. Uh, and that tends to be useful for either liquid solutions, where both the solute and the sol solvent uh, form liquid solutions from liquid solute and liquid solvent, or gas phase solutions where we have a gaseous solute and a gaseous solvent, uh, it, therefore the percent by volume would make sense. We don't tend to see this in other settings. And finally, uh, the last type of solution concentration that we'll talk about is percent by mass. It's the, the same basic idea as a, a percent by volume, only now we're using the mass of solute. Uh, divided by the mass of solution, and obviously this is a convenient way to uh, look at a solution concentration because the masses are relatively easy to uh, come by. So in the hospital setting, you might see something like 0.9 weight percent um, sodium chloride in those saline bags that hang almost all the time from uh, the the uh, patients who are in the hospital for any length of time. So that's a weight percent. Again, a weight percent is technically a mass percent uh, because in science we prefer mass uh, as opposed to weight, which depends on gravity. Okay, so there we have mass of a sol solute divided by mass of the total solution times 100 to make it a percent or mass percent.
And so here we see that same hydrochloric example, hydrochloric acid example that I mentioned previously. Uh, it's a 12.1 molar solution for concentrated hydrochloric acid. It can also be expressed as a mass percent, 38% by mass of hydrogen chloride dissolved in water for concentrated hydrochloric acid. So you see the uh, solution concentrations, we can refer to a solution in multiple uh, concentration terms. And there are many others that we didn't touch on here in the course. Uh, probably some of you are familiar with parts per million, right? That's how the EPA tends to list things, either parts per million or parts per billion, when there's very, very small amounts of uh, a solute in a large amount of solvent. So that's an example of another type of solution concentration that unfortunately we won't have time for. In keeping with the tradition in our text to highlight some green chemistry in each of these chapters so far, uh, let's uh, just mention the idea of atom economy. And uh, that gets at the idea of uh, one of the overall goals of green chemistry, and that's to reduce waste. So the percent atom economy really talks about the reaction efficiency. So if you look here, the percent atom economy equals the molar mass of desired product divided by the molar masses of all reactants times 100% to make it a percent. So uh, obviously the goal here is to uh, use as few reactants and have as little waste as possible so that you're getting your reactants, uh, essentially all of their molar masses to sum to that molar mass of the desired product uh, and have minimal waste wherever possible. So hopefully now with this chapter, you, there's a lot in here. It's a very dense chapter and we have a lot of goals for this chapter. Uh, make sure to visit the worked examples uh, folder under content because uh, many of the things that we talk through uh, don't make a whole lot of sense until you, you see how they're applied to problem solving. So please make sure to, to visit that and take a look at those worked example problems because those will be very useful to helping you understand and apply these concepts for your uh, homework set. Okay, congratulations on completing chapter five.